All right, new case, new topic. Uh, 16-year-old presents with, at 2 a.m. with mild shortness of breath and right-sided chest pain. It's the first episode. Chest x-ray shows a big right pneumothorax, spontaneous pneumothorax. Again, this morning we had a whole session on how to take care of this, so maybe everybody knows now. What next? Chest tube and ED. OR for VATS, observation and try supplemental O2. Aspiration, as we discussed this morning, and repeat chest x-ray or something else. Chuck here. Chuck lies. Chuck, anybody from that panel want to? Chuck, yeah, you gave the talk. So, Whoa. chest tube and ED, OR for VATS is low, and then aspiration and repeat chest X ray. I am competing. Blown. I can't believe those answers. <laughs> you don't believe it, right? People are getting a line. Okay. Go ahead. So, I just presented this this morning. I'm surprised it's 41%. But, um, I just, I think a lot of people... You thought you had done better than that, didn't you, Chuck? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think a lot of us are frustrated with the recurrences with this and looking for reasons to operate, and, but not necessarily operate on everybody because historically not everybody needs an operation. So it's a reasonable thing to try. And um, I think the point is if they're still leaking air when they come in, they're probably going to need an operation. So just operate on them. I'd like to get a hand raise real quick. When we say chest tube and ED... Are we thinking about the old-fashioned argyle chest tube that's this big thing? Are we talking about the, the catheter, the pigtail catheter that Chuck talked about this morning already? So I think chest tube is a little mis... Uh, it's easy to confuse what we're talking about that. Anybody else? Somebody had a hand back there. Uh, Todd's running the wrong way, sorry. Hey, John, take the mic. So I'll say what he's saying. What they're calling putting in a chest, what they're putting in their pigtail catheter for aspiration. What they, what they described as aspiration <laughs> is, in my opinion, putting in a chest tube, and they decided to take it out early rather than leaving it for a period of time. I agree with their approach, but when I say aspiration, I usually mean either putting a small angiocath or something else, drawing it out, and that's a true aspiration. And then do you take it out then? I don't do that. That's just it. We put pigtails in, and it's much easier. And leave it in, right. That's and if the, you have to leave it in, you leave it in. If it goes down after six hours, and so I, I don't know that what they said changes what I would do okay. because it's already Over here? Yeah, I'm going to add, I'm going to add uh, Barry Newman, uh, Portland, Oregon. Uh, I'm going to add an E other uh, that was only 1%, but, um, uh, and this is actually, there is literature supporting this because we were kind of shocked when this first happened. But um, what we've been doing is actually putting the pigtail in, attaching it to Heimlich valve, and they send them home. Uh, they get one x-ray to make sure that the lung is re-expanded. And um, we just follow them as outpatients. So you, you, save an, you save a hospital stay. Uh, you can leave it in for a little bit longer if it seems to be taking a while to come up. Uh, and eventually, by the time we get these catheters removed, most of these kids have not had recurrences probably because we've created enough adhesions from the tube being in there for a long enough time. Uh, so we've had very few recurrences, actually. I think it's a, an optimal way to do it because you save a lot of money, the hospital stay, et cetera, uh, and these kids do very well. Thanks. Go ahead. Right. Uh, Doug Miniati in Roseville, California. Yeah, I would just echo that. We use the same thing, but we use a device called a Thoravent that probably everybody has heard of. Uh, just a one-step thing. The ER guys put it in. Uh, they get sent home. You know, shortly thereafter, after an x-ray confirms they're re-expanded, we see them in clinic and do a test in the clinic and take it out. So in this case, since that was 10 p.m., <laughs> patient was admitted for observation and oxygen therapy. <coughs> do we need to do this before we do anything else? Who gets a chest CT? I don't think, does this one have a thingy? Has what? Is it, I don't see the numbers. Oh, are we counting? Here we there go. it goes. It's a good, good, good eye. All right. Yes. Clear. <laughs> Anybody think that it's crazy not to get who who gets chest CTs? 
It's okay. 10% of people in this room tithe. Uh, I, I have a lot of colleagues that get let, let, so I, I think Can you comment real quick? Can somebody comment? Uh, get, can we get them a mic? Rachel, thank you. We've got two down here in front who both had their hands go up. I think it's good to know if uh, you can already locate the bubbles and uh, that CT scan will be useful for later on if uh, you need to do the... Uh, so even if you were successful with your tube, you would know they have blebs and next time it happened, you might, that might influence you. Daryl? Right here. Mac? Oh, sorry. Mac? Yeah, I would, I would have the patient with the pneumothorax go to the CT scanner and get a CT. And then if there's blebs that I see that are still intact, I would offer an upfront early VATS. Okay. Um, and, then, and then not do any intervention until they get into the operating room. All right, well, let's do this one quickly. So uh, the, the, the next morning, the, the pneumothorax had not gotten better. So now we're back to the same question. I suspect the same sort of information, perhaps, and we'll go on to the next step. So Mac, while we're running through this, we have one comment over here. Okay. Mac, Brian, Brian Gilchrist from Brooklyn. Hey. The guys in Oregon who are taking care of Buffy and Jody, who are upper middle class folks, can go home with a Heimlich valve. In the Bronx, it's not happening. So I just want to point that out. And, and the other thing I think you've got to understand is if we have somebody with a spontaneous pneumothorax in the Bronx or in Brooklyn, and we don't, find a, we don't do a CT scan, we never see these kids again. And so the compliance and the fact of them not coming back pushes us to do something that is in your 1% area and we need to make sure we don't miss those. So I would impart that to you and submit that Heimlich valves aren't playing in the Bronx. You, you can keep reminding us about the geography of treatment. I think that's very <laughs> helpful, very good, very accurate. So every, now we're, we've got 60% uh, going to the OR for VATS and somebody putting about 20, 30% putting in a chest tube. So in this case, they got a pigtail chest tube. Maybe that clears it up. It's not a chest tube, and it's not a catheter. It's a pigtail chest tube. And the pneumothorax resolved, and the pigtail was removed, and the patient went home. You've never seen this, I'm sure. Three weeks later in clinic, and has decreased breath sounds, and chest x-ray with the pneumothorax, bigger than before. Now what? Same, same answers for this for the moment. Uh, this is in the clinic, so it's at 12 at noon. The counter, there we go. Sixty to ninety. There we go. So this, uh, if you go to the OR and you do the blebectomy, <laughs> what about pleurodesis? Dun dun dun. <laughs> You know, it was popular, then it sort of faded away, and don't want to squirt chemicals in there because it hurts. Is Samir Pandia here? I don't okay, there he is. You knew I was going to call on you, man. Let's go to the counter. <laughs> wait, wait till they answer. All right. Now we have to define what that means. All right, Ian. Is it, is it a, a ray tech scrubbing on the chest wall? Do you stick the bovie pad in there and scrub on the chest wall? So who uses a bovie pad? <laughs> and who does like a pleurectomy, pulls down? Pleurectomy, yeah. That's who... choice E. Huh? That's choice E? It should be choice E. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, and did I miss anything else other than bovie pad or pleurectomy? Is there like a... Middle ground? No. Mechanical and chemical. What would you say? Are using the robot? <laughs> what, what are the people who do no pleurodesis use? Wait. So I want to give your comments. Okay. How many of you that have done the pleurodesis have ever had to go back? And what do you see when you went back? Nothing. Nothing. Like you were <laughs> never there. Even after a pleurectomy, that can look that way. Right, so like nothing. So three large studies, one from Korea, two from China, 
take that with whatever amount of grain of salt you want. Um, compared no pleuridesis to just putting fibrin sealant glue. That's it. And all they found is that the group that had pleuridesis just had more pain. But the rate of recurrence was the same. But the study was repeated even without the fibrin glue in the China study, wasn't it? Correct. Yeah. And they no showed the same results, no same difference. Same results, replicated, and these were hundreds of patients. So when I heard you present that, I stopped doing pleurodesis completely. As have, as have I, yeah. and I haven't had an issue. How did they consent to invite you back to the OR? Let's consent? If, it, <laughs> if, if, you, if, you find, if you find blebs that you can resect, why would you need a pleurodesis? Any, like, does anyone want to... So. Fight for, uh, let me ask, would anyone here just now change their management to not doing pleurodesis? Wow, you guys are tough. A couple of people. Okay. Sounds like one area we don't have sorted out yet. Dave, let's put this on the list. <laughs> All right, in this case, blebectomy with mechanical pleurodesis, and you did what? Uh, Bovipad? Uh, I don't do mechanical. You don't does well post-op, and that's a real chest tube, I guess. Not very big, but it's a real one. And a uh, patient goes home. So, Mac, I have a quick question, because yeah. one of my partners who gets CT scans uh, of the chest before they go to the operating room, I asked them why, and they told me so they can look at the other side. So does anyone here, if you see a bleb on the contralateral side of those that get CT scans, how many would then do a, bl a prophylactic blebectomy. So let's ask the second question. How many would do a prophylactic blo uh, uh, resection on the contralateral side if you saw blebs? David Powell. Who else? Say it again, Steve. You, I'd, I'd discuss it with the family and the kid and let them decide. Tell them the, what the risk is. So that, but it's probably easier to just take care of it to go in and Steve? resect the blood. Steve. Yeah. What do you tell the family? I tell them that they're... they're What's the they, risk? Tell them it's a couple percent, that they could have a spontaneous pneumo and that they might have acute symptoms. And if they live in Colorado and they're up in the mountains, that it could be a problem. Or, if, or, or they smoke or they're going on a foreign trip and we could take care of it and eliminate, probably eliminate the risk. So, Mac, Mac, can I ask a question? Go ahead. So who would do a primary VAT and somebody that shows up with a spontaneous pneumothorax? Great question. Primary vats, handful. And yet, somebody's gonna operate on an unsymptomatic, asymptomatic bleb on the other side, but you won't operate on the side that has a spontaneous pneumothorax. One anesthetic, Dave Powell said. So is the anesthetic risk really the deciding reason to do that? I don't know. We're, we're surgeons, right, what's the risk? Question over behind you, yep. Uh, Grant Geisler from Tampa. Uh, one, one thing that I've discovered about doing the, uh, the apical blood resection is I think the whole apex is thinned. I think it's a diffuse disease. And when I've had recurrences, I go back and I can see a healed staple line and I have other blebs elsewhere. So I would take several staple fires across the top. And when I look at the pathology on those, I find subpleural blebs, I find apical fibrosis. So I think the whole apex is thinned. And so when I do the apical resection, I'll take, I don't take a lot of lung tissue out, but I make a concerted effort to go across the top because I think the whole apex is at risk. And I think that decreases my recurrence rate better than any type of pleurodesis. Thank you for sharing the technical aspect. We'll go on to the next case.